Baruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our home. The lecture on my thoughts tonight will be on crowns in Judaism. <clears throat> what do we say about crowns? Well, crowns have had a place in Judaism from the moment that the Jewish nation accepted the Torah from God, God Almighty with the words, Na'aseh v'nishma, which translate to me, and we will do and we will listen. These words were said as the nation stood at the foot of Mount Sinai just before they received the Torah from God Almighty himself. When God created this world, he did so through the medium of the ten spherot, the ten traits that God has taken upon himself. The first trait is called keser, which in Hebrew means crown. The Hebrew word for keser has a gematria, a numerical value of 620, which allude to the 613 commandments given to us by God Almighty, and then the seven major rabbinical commandments, such as lighting Shabbos candles, making blessings, Purim and Hanukkah, etc. So the word crown, keser, alludes to the Torah and mitzvot. It was God's intent with the creation of the world to be Melech HaKal HaOretz, to be the king over all the world. And that is why every year on Rosh Hashanah we celebrate the coronation of God as our king. The Talmud in Shabbos 88a says, the Rav Simi expounded that at the time when the nation of Israel stated, Na Sevenishma, we will do and we will listen, 600,000 ministering angels came down from heaven and tied two crowns on each Jew, one corresponding to Naseh, we will do, and one corresponding to Nishma, we will listen. But when they sinned with the golden calf, then there were 1,200,000 destructive angels that descended and removed both of their crowns from them. Why would there have to be twice as many destructive angels to remove the same crowns that the original ministering angels placed on them? So one answer that is given is that a destructive angel has less strength than a ministering angel. And this is in accordance with the principle stated in the Gemara in Yuma 76a that says the measure of reward is far greater than the measure of punishment. Again, we see God as our benevolent Father, who would much rather give us a reward than administer a punishment. The Zohar states that those crowns that were taken from the people were given to Moshe, our teacher. In Exodus 33.7, the Targum Yonason renders the verses as, Moshe took the crowns and put them in his tent. Rashi states, that it was these crowns that caused Moshe's face to glow. The question is asked, if there was any hope that the Jews would ever again regain those crowns. Interesting enough, the Zohar states that Moshe, in his great love for the Jewish people, actually returned the crowns to them, so to speak, behind their backs, which means that they are there for the taking for whomever wholeheartedly and unconditionally accepts the Torah from Moshe, our teacher. So then every person in every generation, according to his or her degree of Nasev and Nishma, is privy to regaining a certain degree of Torah understanding as those who received it at Mount Sinai from God Almighty himself. When Moshe brought down the Torah from Mount Sinai, he wrote the letters with what we call tagim, the Hebrew word for crowns. There are some letters that have no crowns, others that have one, and yet others that have three. The explanation for these crowns are really beyond the scope of this lecture. However, the Ramban writes in his introduction to his commentary on the Torah that all the world's wisdoms, physics and metaphysics, science, mysticism, are all contained in the words and the letters of the Torah, found in their standard anomalous shapes, in their tagim and points, and in their illusions. The Talmud Menachas 29b states, that it was Rabbi Akiva who derived heaps and heaps of laws from these tagim. Yet today, for the most part, their meanings remain hidden. However, the deeper meaning behind the crowns, as well as the secrets behind the vowels and candelations, will only become revealed with the coming of Mashiach Tzikainu may come quickly and in our time. The next mention of crowns in the Torah is in the third book of the Torah, in the book of Leviticus. In the beginning of the portion of Shemini, chapter 9, verse number 1, there it tells us about the dedication of the tabernacle, of the Mishkan, 
Rashi there states that it was the first day of Nisan and that the day carried with it ten distinctive crowns. They were, it was the beginning of the second year since the exodus from Egypt. It was the first day that sacrifices were brought in the tabernacle. It was the first day that Aaron served as the high priest. It was the first day that the people received the priestly blessings. It was the first day that a heavenly fire descended upon the copper altar. It was the first time that a male goat of the new moon offering was ever sacrificed. It was the first time that, the on, that only animals which had been designated for a certain sacrifice could be eaten. It was the first time that the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, rested on the tabernacle. It was the first day that sacrifices, the gifts of the princes, were offered in, in the tabernacle. And it was the first day that people who were ritually unclean were forced to leave the camp. All told, ten crowns in all. Rabbi Shimon said in Pirkei Elbos, chapter 4, Mishnah 13, there are three crowns. The crown of Torah, the crown of priesthood, and the crown of kingship. But the crown of a good name is greater than all of them. So three of the four primary furnishings in the holiest part of the tabernacle had crowns, golden rims that decorated them, the ark, the golden table, and the golden altar. But the golden menorah did not. Now the ark corresponds to the crown of Torah, the golden altar to the crown of priesthood, and the golden table the place where the twelve showbreads were kept correspond to the crown of kingship. The Medrash tells us that the menorah, which had no rim, corresponds to the crown of a good name. The decorated rim is called a zair, which is closely related to the Hebrew word nazir. A nazir is someone who has accepted upon themselves to dedicate their life to holy purposes by abstaining from wine, hair cutting, and contact with the dead. This state of being, a Nazir, remains in force for a specific period of time that a person has vowed to accept. This could be anywhere from a lifetime commitment to no less than 30 days. So it would seem that the word Zer symbolized raising oneself above the usual desires of humanity and entering into a holier and more spiritual realm. And just as the crown sits on top of the king's head, Above his whole person, so too does a spiritual crown set a person above the norms of the physical world. Each of the three furnishings in the tabernacle, which represented, again, Torah, kingship, and priesthood, indicated that there was a need to rise above, to, so to speak, guard oneself against the potentially harmful elements inherent in each of these concepts. Torah study, while it is essential to a Jewish life, it carries with it the possibility of gaiva, of arrogance. It can result in a false sense of superiority over one's peers. It's especially true since one's IQ, one's family, one's financial status, and one's education are many times just an accident of birth. The king must obviously be very careful not to overrate himself and lord it over his subjects. The position itself brings with it pride and ego since, after all, he has automatically showered with honor and respect. So the Torah places extra restrictions that apply only to a king, such as prohibitions against too many wives, too many horses, and too much money. They testify to the necessity for care in these areas. Also the Kohen. He commands a position of great honor and respect in the community. This position can be abused and used for selfish advantage of those who are unscrupulous. This was seen in the Second Temple era, where the office of the high priest was bought and then used to benefit certain individuals and groups. It was not used for the service of God or the people at large. The sages, realizing the challenge of gaiva, of arrogance, and that could exist especially to the king and the high priest, instituted that where we bow four times in the Amidah, the standing prayer. The high priest bows at the beginning and the end of each of the 18 blessings. The king, he bows at the beginning and end of each, uh, bow, pardon me, the king bows at the first word, Baruch, and stays bowed throughout the entire prayer until the last word, Shalom. The greater the man, the greater need for humility. 
a prerequisite for the crown of a good name. So each of these three gifts to the children of Israel come with unique challenges. They all need special attention and protections to ensure that they are used only for the service of God and not for self-seeking purposes of unscrupulous individuals. However, the menorah, which represents the crown of a good name, is attainable by every member of the Jewish nation. It has no rim. It is not a crown that is inherited by kingship or priesthood, nor is it taught or studied from teachers like the crown of Torah. Rather, it is a crown that is earned through years of positive actions in the face of trying and difficult situations. The brightly burning lamps of the menorah shine with the glow of godly light. This is a light that can be received and internalized by all who seek it. There is no potential for evil that is associated with this pure divine influence. There is only good for those who are prepared to receive it, and therefore the menorah needed no rim. The wording of the mission in Pirkei Vos 4 through 13 tells us a great deal about the advantage of a good name. It states there, there are three crowns, but then it ends with the words, but the crown of a good name, Ole al Gabehan, rises above all of them. This teaches us that no matter who you are or what your station in life is, without a shame tov, without a good name, a solid reputation, the others are lacking. In, addi in addition, each of the three regolim, fast of festivals of Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot are linked to one of these crowns. Pesach, the moment when the children of Israel became a royal nation, connects to the crown of kingship. Shavuot, the time of the giving of the Torah, connects with the crown of Torah. And Sukkot, the holiday that celebrates the return of the clouds of glory, which came in the merit of Aaron, connects to the crown of priesthood. Each of these three festivals had the inherent danger mentioned before, and so extra care must be taken at these times to avoid misusing their great spiritual potential for selfish goals. In fact, each of the three festivals has an element of judgment associated with it, which reflects the fact that one's service of God is under scrutiny at these times of the year based on the Talmud in Rosh Hashanah 1-2. This element of judgment, however, is not present on the Shabbat, which is similar to the menorah, which has no golden rim. According to the Arizal, there is no potential for abuse present in the atmosphere which prevails on the Shabbat. Everything can be used for spiritual advancement on this very special day. Even the most mundane actions, such as eating and sleeping, become holy. There's another connection between the Shabbat and the menorah. Both are selfless. The Shabbat comes as a day where we are commanded to rest. It is a day of spirituality. And so too the menorah and the temple serve the world. It was not needed to light up the temple at night since there were no services that were performed in the temple at that time. So when Shlomo Melch built the temple, he built the windows so that they would be narrow at the inside and wide at the outside, which is the opposite of what one would do if they were building a house. One would want all that light to illuminate the interior of their home. He built it in the exact opposite way. Since his intent was not to illuminate the temple, but to illuminate the world at large. Spirituality is always selfless, a trait associated with the shame tov, a good name. Wealth can wax and wane, rich today, poor tomorrow. Wealth is in God's hands. You know, we see smart people that can't make a living, and stupid people will somehow become very wealthy. A good name is earned. It's not bought or passed on. However, just like wealth, it can be easily lost. As the states in Pirkei Avos Hill said, Al Tam in do not trust yourself until the day of death. We need to stay awake at the wheel. It seems like it takes a lifetime to achieve a prominent position, a good name, but it only takes seconds to lose it. Shlomo Melch wrote in Kohalat, the book Ecclesiastes, in 7 1, Tom Tov Shem Mishem and Tov. Better a good name than precious oil. He lists seven excellent things that a man must make as absolute necessities of his own existence. These will cling to him not only during his lifetime, 
but also after his death. The first position that he mentions is the Shem Tov, good name. Learning is not enough. One must also have good deeds. For a good name is better than oil, and oil in this context is an allusion to Torah wisdom. We see an allusion to this statement with the first letter, Tess, in the opening word Tov, good, being written larger than any of the other letters in this verse. This was done to emphasize that there is more good, Tov, in a good name than there is in precious oil. Again, Torah study. As it states in Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, Mishnah 17, Reb Shimon, the son of Reb Gamil, said that study is not the main objective. Only putting your, your learning into practical application should be one's main purpose. The Gamachi of the letter Tess is nine, and as we have mentioned many times in lectures before, the number nine is allusion to truth. If you multiply nine times any other number, it will always come back to nine. Truth never changes. When it comes to marriage, the bride and groom, Chassan and Kala, are also referred to as a king and queen for the first year of marriage. In Mishle, in Proverbs 12.4, it states, Isha, a teret bala, that a woman is the crown of her husband. In Pirkei Jebelezer, chapter 6, it states that a groom is similar to a king. And just like a king doesn't go out to the marketplace alone, so too a Chassan doesn't go out to the marketplace alone. And just as a king doesn't do any work, so too a chassan doesn't do any work. As I've mentioned many times before, nothing, nothing in this world is an accident. Tomorrow night we'll begin a minor holiday of sorts in the Jewish calendar. It's called Lag Ba'omer, which translates to mean the 33rd days of the counting of the Omer. On this special day we celebrate the passing of Rav Shimon Bar Yechoi, a second century Tana who is credited with authoring the Zohar. <clears throat> The Zohar, the book, contains an esoteric method, discipline, and school of thought in Jewish mysticism. It forms the foundation of mystical religious interpretations within Judaism. He was able to wear both the crown of Torah and the crown of, Torah, of a good name at the same time. And we see that after 18 centuries, we still celebrate his life and lifetime accomplishments. This is true all over the world, but especially in Moron, the town in Israel where he is buried. Hundreds of thousands of people gather from all types of backgrounds to dance, to sing, and to make bonfires, to celebrate his great legacy of Torah and Shem Tov, of a good name. This concept of a crown is not limited to life in this world. The Talmud in Brachos 17a states that the world to come will not be like this world, and it states, Tzadikim Yoshim Yatroseim Vereshayim and the Hedem Zivashchina. Rather, that the righteous will sit with crowns on their heads and delight in the radiance of the Divine Presence. What that really means? I have absolutely no idea. However, when an unborn baby is living in its mother's womb, everything about its existence is totally different than the world it's about to enter. Baby lives in water, we live in air. Baby lives in total darkness and seclusion, bent over with little movement. Everything that is open in the womb is closed when the baby is born. There is nothing that you can tell that baby that will repair it for what this world is all about. All you can tell the baby is get ready to be wowed. The same can be said about our existence in this world compared to what our existence will be like in the next world. So it would be useless for God Almighty to explain to us something that is spiritual when we really have no reference to it in our physical world. All we can do is to get ready to be wowed. Yet we ask God constantly to bring Mashiach. Not that we understand, nor that we can understand what we're asking for. All that we know is that there is a Father in Heaven who loves us dearly. And if He says that what is waiting for us is special and wonderful, then we can trust that it will be exactly that and so much more. So let us pray that the day is near when we will be able to crown the descendant of King David, the true King Mashiach with sovereign kingship over Israel and the whole world. And may God bless us with his coming quickly and in our time and with all the blessings that he will bring. Again, thank you very much for listening. God should bless you with, again, good health, happiness, and safety. Uh, have a Shabbat Shalom. And again, enjoy Lagba Omer tomorrow. 
and uh, well, blessings to you and your family. Thank you again.